Well, my gentle and of course very modern apes, it seems as though our family tree has just gotten a lot more interesting again. So far it's been a really great past six months for paleoanthropology. And like usual, when someone comes out with some new and exciting scientific information, it is ruffling some feathers. Today we're looking at a hominin, so an ape that is on the human line after the human chimpanzee split approximately seven million years ago. And this hominin belongs to the genus Paranthropus which you might not have heard of if you're only tangentially involved in paleoanthropology. <laughs> Paranthropus is a sister group on the hominin family tree, a sister group to genus Homo. This means that it is likely that Paranthropus and genus Homo, our genus, share a common ancestor in the form of Australopithecus. It also means that Australopithecus is probably paraphyletic, if it is indeed the case that Paranthropus and Homo converge on an Australopithecus common ancestor. But we're not here to discuss the exciting world of the paraphyletic nature of Australopithecus, probable paraphyletic nature. We're here to discuss a new paper that has evidently created a potential tie between Paranthropus and some of the oldest instances of Old Dewan tool culture. And this is really interesting because this is actually not just an Old Dewan tool culture site, it is now the oldest Old Dewan tool site at three million years of age, and it's not associated with genus Homo. Now, if you're not hip to the hominin jive, that probably is a little bit nonsensical sounding to you. You might be thinking, okay, like, so what? What does this matter? Well, let me tell you what the paradigm has been. So let me pitch you the simplified consensus so you can understand where we were at before this paper came along in sort of a breakneck pace, okay? So generally speaking, the story has gone that you have Australopithecus, the genus Australopithecus, at around three million years ago, and it is from Australopithecus, a sort of generalized hominin, that we see the emergence of two different genera. Homo and Paranthropus. Homo begins with Homo habilis, and Homo habilis, depending on the dating of a certain mandible, is potentially as old as 2.8 million years of age. On the other hand, we have genus Paranthropus. Genus Paranthropus is around 2.7 million years of age and starts with Paranthropus aethiopicus. And when you look at these two individuals, they are starkly different, and yet they can both be drawn, like with a through line, morphologically speaking, to Australopithecus. This is usually done by looking at sort of the minutia in the teeth and other aspects of facial morphology. So Homo habilis and Paranthropus have a very interesting relationship. Back in the 1930s, excavation began at a site called Olduvai Gorge, which is located in Tanzania in East Africa. This is a site that is absolutely rife with hominins, and it's a site that very quickly was characterized by the presence of stone tools. After the stone tools were discovered, a hominin was discovered, but it wasn't Homo habilis. In fact, it was Paranthropus, who at the time was being called Zinjanthropus, the Nutcracker Man. However, paleoanthropologists looked at the size of its brain case and the bizarre nature of its teeth, which we'll talk about shortly, and they concluded that it probably wasn't the maker of the stone tools that were found at the site. So they kept looking, and eventually they dug up Homo habilis, whose name quite literally means handy man. And this worked with the definition of Homo at the time, right? Its brain case was a little small for the previous definition of Homo, which had been defined by Homo erectus, but that being said, it was bipedal, just like all the previous members of genus Homo, and most importantly, it had those stone tools, and likely the dexterous hands to forge them. Our definition of genus Homo now is certainly different from the definition of genus Homo then. Now it's based off of things like overall brain case size and facial minutia and minutia in the postcrania. And the reason for this is because obviously years later we found Australopithecus postcrania and we found out that these guys are definitively bipeds, like there is no getting around it. We found out that their brain case size can range a little bit higher and indeed that Homo's brain case size can range a little bit lower, meaning they can overlap. And we found out that that Australopithecus has some pretty dexterous looking hands. So things are a little bit more complicated now. 
Some of the first associations of stone tools and hominins also involved sort of uh, cut bones, right? So bones with big, deep cut marks in them, which suggested to a lot of anthropologists, and this is an idea that persists to this day, that stone tool use either was spurred by or facilitated meat consumption. I certainly think that there is a line to be drawn between the advent of meat consumption and having the metabolic ability to fuel a large brain, but that's kind of a story for another time. So at this point, we see Homo with a very clear characterization, right? Homo the generalist. The brain case size gets bigger, the teeth in the dental arcade get smaller, the snout retracts, it becomes more orthognathic or flat faced, and you get overall a more gracile looking creature that relies more on its toolbox than having big teeth or jaws. And this fits with what we see with genus Homo. Typically where we find stone tools, we also find genus Homo. And everything about genus Homo suggests a generalized omnivore that's capable of eating and willing to eat just about anything it comes across. This might be one of the reasons why humans were so successful at dominating our environment wherever we go. We aren't picky. So if genus Homo is the generalist, then that would make Paranthropus the specialist. And it does indeed look at first glance and at second glance, and at third glance, that Paranthropus is a specialist. It's a specialized herbivore. This is a bipedal ape, a hominin, that is closer to living humans than it is to any other living ape. And yet, look at the teeth. It's got tiny incisors in the front, nipping, tiny reduced canine teeth, much like humans. In fact, some would propose these are even more reduced than human canines. It's got massive molars. These are some of the biggest molars for an animal's body size out there in the animal kingdom. They're like the size of my thumbnail. They're four times the size of a human molar. And it has huge anterior zygomatics that anchor powerful chewing muscles alongside the sagittal crest. These chewing muscles being the masseter and the temporalis. This thing is a perfect herbivore. It's a big cow-like ape. And it would have been pretty intimidating to see on the landscape because like other hominins, it does in fact have the anterior foramen magnum, which means we know for a fact, along with the other postcrania for Paranthropus, that this thing was bipedal just like us. And so we seem to have a nice neat story, right? Australopithecus begets two different genera. One is the mighty generalist, the omnivorous homo habilis, aided by its toolkit, sweeps across the landscape, continuing to diversify, expand its toolkit, and conquer every biome it comes across, leaving carnage in its wake, and leaving Paranthropus, the specialized herbivore, in the dust to go extinct a couple million years later. Except we just found a new site with the oldest appearance of old Wan stone tools, and the only hominin that's there with them is Paranthropus. So as usual with these new papers, we're gonna read it, and we can because it's open access. It's titled Expanded Geographic Distribution and Dietary Strategies of the Earliest Old One Hominins and Paranthropus by Plummer et al. And they're going to be very careful with their language, which is um, fair. We'll start with the abstract, as usual, like I already said. In the abstract, we see the oldest Oldowan tool sites from around 2.6 million years ago have previously been confined to Ethiopia's Afar Triangle. We describe sites at Nyayanga, Kenya, dated from roughly 3 to 2.5 million years ago, and expand this distribution by over 1,300 kilometers. Furthermore, we found two hippopotamid butchery sites associated with mosaic vegetation and a C4 grazer-dominated fauna. Tool flaking proficiency was comparable with that of younger Oldowan assemblages, but pounding activities were more common. Tool use wear and bone damage indicate plant and animal tissue processing. Paranthropus species teeth, the first from southwestern Kenya, possess carbon isotopic values indicative of a diet rich in C4 foods. We argue that the earliest Oldowan was more widespread than previously known, used to process diverse foods including megafauna, and associated with Paranthropus from its onset. Okay, so a couple of things should stand out to you right away. First and foremost, obviously it's old, right? three to 2.5 million years ago. So truly this is our oldest Oldowan tool site. This is the second thing that sticks out. The tools aren't just present. They were used to butcher hippopotamuses at this site. 
that's really, really interesting. And not only that, but evidently also um, diverse types of vegetation. They find tool flaking proficiency, so you know the, the skill at which these tools are made, and in that it's comparable with the younger older one assemblages that we find, but also there's a lot of pounding activity. So it seems as if the tool users were, they're okay at making these normal older one uh, stone tools, but they're also incorporating some older strategies of just like pounding two rocks together, which is you know, precisely what you would expect if the stone tool user uh, has a brain that's like comparable to Homo habilis, but perhaps wasn't wired exactly the same way as Homo habilis seems to have been more predisposed for what we see in later genus Homo, potentially. They see tool use wear and bone damage indicate plant and animal tissue processing, as we said. Um, and they note that the parenthropus like teeth that are found there have isotopic values that indicates what is pretty common for parenthropus, a diet rich in C4 foods. And then they argue that the, well, the one tool culture is more widespread and that so was parenthropus and that maybe, just maybe, given parenthropus is the only hominin at the site and they're careful in how they phrase this, maybe parenthropus made the tools. Let's take a minute to talk about what Oldowan tools look like. Of our three typical stages, Oldowan is the oldest. It is some of the most basic types of stone tools, and usually they look something like this. This is a chopper. It's a pretty simple chopper, but it's got some nice sort of faces here where, you know, rock has been napped off using another rock. Napping is actually really hard to do. You, you should read tutorials and try it for yourself. But basically you hold it like this and it acts like a little hand axe and you utilize it to uh, process foods. You can scrape meat off of bone. You can create striations on bone and the percussive fractures are really only gotten, they only show up if you're slamming two rocks together with intent. So you don't get something like this just from rolling down a hill. And if you wonder like how do archeologists in this case and paleoanthropologists know this, it's because we make these, like you can make these yourself and you can, you can track the types of fractures that are created by smacking two rocks together versus rolling a rock down the hill. You can also make sure that the types of scrapes that are produced using a stone tool like this are analogous to the types of scrapes that we find on ancient bones. And then you can draw a one-to-one -one comparison if the stone tools are found at the site and the scraped bones are found at the site and there's no other explanation. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's an Occam's razor situation. Really what you need to appreciate is that this is what an old one stone tool looks like. And these are the kinds that we find at the site in question for this paper. So next they go over some of the geochronology, how they dated things. They have this nice side picture of the strata, the composite, where we see where Paranthropus is located. And to be clear, the Paranthropus material from the site is just two molars. That's not a lot. It's definitely Paranthropus, right? These guys are pretty characteristic in what their molars look like. Nothing has molars like these guys on planet Earth, which is really cool and really interesting. So at least we know they're Paranthropus and we don't find the molars or the teeth of any other hominin at the site. So they talk a little bit about the magnetostratigraphic work that they did to sort of clock the, the ranges, the range for the ages. Um, and then they talk about the artifacts. We recovered 330 artifacts. That's a lot. It would be one thing if they're talking about pulling one you know, piece of debitage out of this site, but we have 330 artifacts, likely including full on stone tools, so your cores, flakes, things like that, um, and just the remains or the, um, the, the, the flakes that are more collateral than actually being utilized. They talk about the presence, here we go, cortical flakes and hammer stones with battering damage is consistent with on-site flake production through hard hammer percussion. Artifacts were manufactured from a diverse array of raw materials, including rhyolite, quartzite, and quartz. They talk about how it's distinct and containing a lot of cores. Um, and then here's some of the pictures. So we've got some that look, ooh, this one looks just like the one that we have here. This looks like a very familiar stone tool. And this is not like a recreation rocks just all look the same, sorry geologists. And then some of them are less impressive looking, but some of them certainly, these these are very clearly stone tools. They do um, an analysis here. I'm not 100% what did, what kind did they do? They plot according to, it's a P, it's a principal components analysis. It is a PCA. So they're doing a principal component analysis here. Um, then they talk about the bones that they found. 1,776 bones were recovered in situ, and they've got um, photographs of those. They talk about the specimens. Here's the really interesting part though, right? They say bone surface preservation was highly variable. So really they're only gonna be looking at the stuff that is has preserved quite well. 
um, with 85% of the sample in both excavations showing no or minimal weathering. So this is consistent with bursts of rapid burial by fluvial sediment. So like rivers flooding, seasonal monsoons, things like that. But I digress. Here's the cool part. Hippopotamid butchery is documented in both excavations three and excavation five. A minimum of two hippopotamid individuals were recovered from excavation. The more complete individual is composed of 241 bone fragments from across the skeleton, including a large axial concentration, likely marking its death site. Stone tools were closely associated with the skeleton, including several tools recovered in direct physical contact with hippopotamid bones. Despite the varied bone preservation, one hippopotamid rib, fra rib fragment exhibits deep cut marks with clearly preserved internal striations, and three stone flakes exhibit use wear indicative of butchery. So they're able to draw a direct one-to-one -to, -one to a specific bone with some flakes that are also showing clear wear. And that's, there could be more, I suppose. I mean, we could get greedy and say, I wish all of the, the bones on the hippopotamid you know, individuals were, were preserved and all of them had striations, but like these are really clearly from stone tools. I'm not a lithics person and I'm sure the lithics people could come after me for some of the stuff that I've said in this, just because I'm sure I've said some wrong stuff with lithics, at least with regard to some of the terminology or pronunciation or things like that. But these are clearly cut marks, right? I, there is nothing in nature that isn't sort of done via stone tools that is going to create these clean striations at such a high frequency, at least not that I know of. So they continue on to talk about how, which individuals they're from, uh, the tool damaged bones of non hippopotamid taxa were also found. So it's not just hippopotamids that have the uh, tool marks on them. They have a bobbed uh, scapular spine fragment with cut marks. So that's the shoulder blade, a portion of the shoulder blade. Other bones with cut marks and percussion damage showed that hominins were consuming both meat and marrow. So it's not just the cut marks, they're also crushing the bones open and getting at the marrow inside. Overall frequencies of hominin damage from the excavation are low, 0.1 and 1.9 at excavations 3 and 5 respectively. In part, this reflects poor surface preservation of many of the fossils as well as the fragmentation of the ribs. So, you know, we could have more if we'd gotten here earlier, but what we have is still very compelling. Use wear observed, so this is where they talk about the, um, the use wear on the actual tools themselves, as well as some of the specific types of tools. They do stable carbon isotopic analysis of some of the carbonates, um, and then they do a stabilized stop analysis of the enamel, right, of Paranthropus and some of the other critters that were here. Um, they say that Ethiopian sites, let's see, similar C4 grazer dominated ecosystems are dominated via the Ethiopian sites of Litigararu and Mililagia. Um, this is important, right, because what they're doing in this section is they're talking about looking at the assemblage, looking at the isotopic ratios of the teeth of other animals, the bobbits and things of that nature. And it's analogous to the assemblages at other places. This means that the ecosystem here at this site is similar to the ecosystems in other places where we're finding stone tools, homo, and paranthropus all contemporaneously. That's very interesting and important. So they say two hominin individuals. So here's our teeth from bed NY1 are assigned to paranthropus or both paranthropus. They're both molars, probably the M2s. Um, and I believe the M1 is one of the other ones. I think, yeah, probably the M1. And they talk about how they're in situ. They take the isotopic analysis and here's how they plot. So in this analysis right here in figure four, Paranthropus finds from the site, the C14 plants are here. The percentage of C14 is here on the Y axis and the age is here on the X. And what you'll find is that our big diamonds are the Paranthropines from this site, members of Paranthropus from this site. And here they are, they plot with other Paranthropus. Pretty typical of Paranthropus. There's nothing anomalous about these two individuals. For the record, you'll notice that HOMO, our circles, have a wide range, but they're certainly lower down. And this is because hominins, just like we, we eat a lot of stuff, HOMO especially is, is highly diverse. But Ardipithecus and Australopithecus, earlier hominins, are more C3 biased. So they're probably eating more fruits, which is what we would expect from a generalist that yields a specialist and another general, generalist. Excuse me. Um, so they talk about the butchery sites, and here's where it says Paranthropus molar uh, K and M NG seven seven three sixteen from excavation three hippopotamid butchery site is a clear association of a hominin fossil with artifacts, raising the possibility that Paranthropus made and or co-opted the stone tools. Although its skull anatomy was not preserved, they're gonna say that Paranthropus like does not look like something that's eating meat, right? It has the flat molars with poor shearing capacity. However, its specialized nathic morphology may not have precluded tool use. This is really important, 
right? Humans, if you just discovered our teeth and you never discovered a single human tool, you wouldn't think that humans were as omnivorous as we are. We eat a lot of meat for what our morphology looks like. And that's because we utilize tools. Now, it's obviously a little bit different as compared to Paranthropus because all of genus Homo, just like Australopithecus, most of Australopithecus, I guess I should say, has a generalized morphology. So we don't look like we're eating a lot of meat because we have teeth and jaws that are adapted to basically eat everything. Whereas Paranthropus has molars that aren't just not adapted for eating meat. They don't just look like they weren't utilized for eating meat because they don't have like shearing crests or anything like that. They look like they're adapted for the opposite, right? For grinding up material, right? Either being a lot of grass or, or hard material, things of that nature, things like nuts. Um, so this is interesting, right? That we find Paranthropus associated with these tools because they're right. The fact that its morphology looks one way doesn't preclude what it was actually eating. And in fact, when we look at primates, primates across the board, even the specialized folivores, things are eating almost nothing but leaves, when they're given the opportunity, they're opportunistic omnivores. When some critter scritters by, right, they're gonna grab it and eat it because it's a little bit extra energy. So they say extra oral, sure. Cutting and pounding with stone tools could have provided access to carcasses within bone and within bone nutrients and made plant and animal tissue easy to chew and digest, potentially allowing Paranthropus to expand its diet. Although not found at this site, Homo was also present in Eastern Africa at the time of the deposition, and so these artifacts cannot definitively be attributed to any specific hominin genus. Um, and, th and that's kind of like their, their ending point, right? Like, yes, this is really interesting. We have one, the oldest old one site, two, the only hominin that's there is Paranthropus, three, butchery was definitely occurring at the site of animals, right? Like the tools weren't, be used, weren't being used for um, herbivorous food processing, like cutting grass and grinding it up. They were being explicitly used for carnivory here. Um, and there's no homo at this site. Now, does that necessarily mean that Paranthropus made the tools. No, but I think we should talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So let's let's kind of read how they finished it up here. The behaviors preserved at uh, Nyanga are at least 600,000 years older than prior evidence of megafaunal carcass and plant processing and substantially predate the increase in absolute brain size documented in the genus Homo after 2 million years. The late Pliocene expanded geography of the early Oldowan and new evidence of its use in diverse tasks amplifies our understanding of the adaptive advantage of early stone technology in the hominin diet and foraging ecology. I've seen some coverage on this refer to it as a paleoanthropological whodunit, right? Who made the stone tools? And I'd just like to point out that almost always in paleoanthropology, at least in like most of the cases that I've seen, and granted I'm not a lithics person, so I don't read like a ton on this, but I've seen quite a bit. When you find stone tools at a site and you find a hominin at the site, those two are linked. There really isn't a lot of guesswork going on there. If we find hominin and we find stone tools, it's pretty clear that the hominin that was there made the stone tools because hominins are the only stone tool makers outside of, well, I guess I should say hominids are the only stone tool makers excluding capuchins. So probably reasonable to say the hominin made it given we know hominins are in the area. Except in this case, where people seem to be having a very hard time saying that Paranthropus might have been the stone tool maker, even though there's no other hominin at the site. People are having a very tough time letting Paranthropus into the stone tool club, because this is the first time that we've been able to draw like a decently definite association here. And this also kind of makes you wonder, what about that other stone tool site that we discussed earlier? Was Homo habilis really the stone tool maker there? Was it the sole stone tool maker there or was Paranthropus getting in on the action as well? For me, I think what this does is it opens up a possibility. It says to me, Paranthropus might have also been using stone tools. Was it making them? I don't know. Now, I think in the case of our previous site, Homo habilis was almost certainly a tool user because we found associations at other locations with Homo habilis being the only hominin there. Lenny Gararu is one of the primary sites. That's where we find that potentially very old 2.8 million year old mandible. And so if that is in fact the case, well, it, it looks like Homo habilis is a, tool, is a tool maker. The question is, is Paranthropus also one? Because if Paranthropus is responsible for the old one tools at this site, that says two things to me. One, Paranthropus might have been more of a generalist than we give it credit for, and its teeth might be an adaptation, as previous support has shown, for a fallback diet. 
What is a fallback diet? Well, allow me to explain it with an example using modern day gorillas. Gorillas today have big shearing premolars and their teeth are basically adapted for leaf eating. And they do eat leaves a lot, except when fruit is in season, gorillas will 10 times out of 10 preferentially eat fruit over leaves. And fruit is in season for like not a small portion of the year. What this means is that their morphology is adapted for the more extreme aspect of their diet not what they prefer to eat or what they eat normally. It's been proposed that something similar is going on with Paranthropus. It's big flat molars don't have like pock marks of eating hard foodstuffs like nuts, which is where it gets the orig original name Nutcracker Man. Instead, it looks like it's usually eating softer foods like grass. So it may be that the teeth are adapted for just a more extreme version of the diet that may have been applicable only during hard times of the year, perhaps when it would have had to normally compete with things like Australopiths or genus Homo, Paranthropus would fall back on a food that those those guys couldn't eat the hard foods like nuts, and that's where the big teeth and the big powerful chewing muscles come in. Now, that being said, none of that precludes Paranthropus as an occasional meat eater, and Paranthropus would have been intelligent. It had a 550cc brain case size. This is almost double what we see in chimpanzees today. So is it possible that Paranthropus like, saw other hominins eating meat and was like, well, shoot, I can do that. I can do that too. And then when they left, they just come over and co-opt the tools and do it for themselves. I mean, this is a very just so story, right? But at the same time, Paranthropus is the only one at that site and a hippopotamus, two hippopotami, and indeed many other animals were butchered there, as well as plant material, which Paranthropus also ate. That part is a bit of speculation though. What we do know is that Homo is definitively like omnivorous. Homo is eating a lot of different things and it's utilizing a toolkit to do a lot of that resource exploitation. Now we seem to have evidence that Paranthropus might've been doing that as well. And that is pretty cool. Just as a sort of tantalizing and kind of out there idea that I've heard proposed by one of my colleagues, it was sort of in jest, he, he proposed it sort of in jest, and I know he'll see this, so this one's for you, my friend. Um, what if Paranthropus was also being butchered at the site? Like, we don't have any evidence that hominins were predating on other hominins at this time, but I suppose it's not completely out of the question that whatever hominin made the stone tools, perhaps a hominin that we for sure have an association with numerous times outside of the context of this site, being Homo habilis, or perhaps even, this is too old for Homo erectus, but something like Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis, what if it was eating Paranthropus? So what if those teeth are what's left of Paranthropus, which was at the butchery site because it was being butchered, not because it was doing the butchering? We don't have any support for this idea, but it's certainly fun to think about and it's not necessarily precluded. My two cents on the whole situation is at this point in time, I think Genus Homo is utilizing tools. In fact, I think tool use extends significantly further back in time than even this 3 million year date if the Lamequi tools are anything to go off of. If the Lamequi tools are anything to go off, this means Australopithecus or perhaps Canianthropus was a utilizer of stone tools, which would mean that Homo is just carrying on that tradition. And if that's the case, and I do think that there is a lot of support for that idea, why couldn't Paranthropus also utilize tools, particularly given it seems as though Paranthropus also descended from Australopithecus? If Australopithecus is the Lomequi tool user, and those are in fact stone tools, well, then the predisposition for tool making exists in both Paranthropus and Homo. I don't see why not. But that being said, I think we definitely need more work done. It would be really nice if we could find one more site that just has Paranthropus and um, stone tools and butchered animals. I think that would be really helpful in making this case for a lot of the people who are thinking, no, it's probably just Homo habilis and they didn't preserve the site or we haven't found them yet and Paranthropus was just also living there, much like the early site that we talked about. As sort of a side note, I get a weird sentiment from the folks that are railing really, really hard against these being Paranthropus made stone tools. It reminds me a little bit, and I know this is like kind of cringe and mean, but it reminds me a little bit of the creationist stylings of sort of this human exceptionalism. Only humans and things quote unquote on their way to becoming humans can be tool users, can do the human thing, because obviously everything else was a failure of evolution and not meant for greatness. 
like we are. You know, in reality, of course, humanity, in the case of anatomically modern Homo sapiens, like the, we're one way of being a human. And indeed, there were many other hominins that were doing similar things to anatomically modern Homo sapiens, but not identical things. And a lot of them had a tenure on Earth that at present is longer than that of Homo sapiens as we are now. So, you know, it depends on how you measure success, and if you're doing it based on longevity, then they were more successful than we are. And humans, in our current state, aren't the only success story of the hominin line. They're tool-use gatekeepers, is what I'm saying. So, more work to be done, but a very promising and sort of cool advancement, right? Ultimately, it just goes to show that it's really, really unwise to ever try to box a hominin into any given behavior or lack of behavior, incapability of a behavior, because hominins are just really cool and really weird and really flexible and very innovative. And that's what made us so successful. So, you know, if you say a hominin can't do a thing, you're just astrally putting that back in time and those hominins are like, I can do the thing, I'll show you, I'll do the thing. And so my gentle and of course very modern apes, um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna continue to make videos. They continue to come out on Wednesdays. I know all of you saw, but we reached 50K. So, you know, blow a little party, party, what is it, whistle, a party whistle? Whatever, those things that you blow and then the it's like, beep, beep. you know what I'm talking about. Blow one of those, throw some confetti, leave me a congratulations comment, definitely for that reason and not for the algorithm. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of thing, because it really helps me out. And if you feel like it, you can support me via Patreon. Remember, I'm asking every time now because evidently it works and more people subscribe. Um, and so in the meantime, until next time, please do take care of yourselves. Thank you.